But now that Christmas is here, I would love to proclaim to you that this is a great day of ecstasy and euphoria. My desire, and perhaps yours as well, is that I can stand here and proclaim all is well. It is, after all, Christmas, the high point of our year. If all is not well and right on Christmas, well then, when will everything be well and right? Can anything be better than Christmas? But I can't help but notice that there is much that surrounds the day of Christmas that surrounds every other day of the year. That is to say, even today, there are people whom we know who are in the hospital. There are those grieving the loss of loved ones. Yes, it is Christmas, but rescue squads will be called into duty today. Fire trucks will respond to calls. Can't imagine anyone saying, sorry lady, uh, it's Christmas, you just going to have to wait. Besides all this, we know as well that there are other obligations, routine obligations that are not exempt just because it's Christmas. Bills awaiting us, jobs that will require our presence again. All of this, even at Christmas. Now, to be honest, I'd love to be the first to say otherwise. I'd love to say that at least for this day, all is well, worries are gone, disease is healed, no 911 calls, no emergencies, nor death, nor misfortune. There is given to us at least this one day of paradise and utopia. Well, you and I, we, we can remember those moments in our lives, can't we? Those moments when we are lifted up to those higher places where we seem to be beyond the reach of worries and nasty obligation and all those things that keep us tethered to earth. We remember those, those rare and, and fragile and blessed places. I think of colonial Williamsburg. It's where Paul and I spent most of our honeymoon. It's where we and our two daughters have gone several times after Christmas. In years past, Paul and I will head out there for a few days this week, and while we're there, there will be no phone service in Williamsburg. I'm just letting you know. If you try to reach us, they're just some strange experiment in Williamsburg this week. And it's a place where I've often felt very far removed from all worldly claims, especially at night, walking down Duke of Gloucester Street, the sides of which are dotted with bonfires. No traffic to be found everywhere, safe to walk even in the middle of the street. Seasonal decorations of wreaths with real fruit, taverns and historical buildings standing proudly on either side, the air cool and crisp, the night quiet with stars and planets and moon hurled against an ebony sky. An otherworldly experience, one in which for a brief and beautiful moment at least, the claims and demands of all else are at rest. Blessed moment, all is well, peace. Think also of going to the beach, the vacations. We spent several times at Tybee Island, Savannah, Georgia. Just a wonderful time to get away. We'd love to do so again. And, and just, uh, <coughs> just drift away and enjoy that blessed and beautiful moment. Because there is where all else is put on hold and nothing else for us to do but to enjoy the gift of this time away, to enjoy this place of heart. To breathe the new air we had not breathed before and see that which we haven't seen. Be inspired, refreshed, and for a while at least, all cares and concerns of the world don't touch us. You know those experiences. We've been to those places, lived through those times where nothing else mattered. Maybe talking about vacations, honeymoons, worship experiences, marriages, baptisms. We may remember services of Holy Week. Christmas Eve or Christmas. Blessed moments are all of these, but blessed and holy moments that just seem to be too brief. There's a certain pastor named Fred Craddock who a few years ago was worshiping at a church in Dallas, Texas. And for Craddock, this service of worship 
turned out to be a powerful, moving, and otherworldly experience. The scripture, the message, the music, all lifted Craddock into another place where he was far removed from all those worldly claims upon his life. And so moving and powerful was the service that at the close of worship, following the benediction, as all others left, Craddock just stood transfixed, unable to move, lost in wonder, love, and praise. And as he stood, wish, wishing that this experience with God just would not end, a man in a pew behind Craddock leaned forward and said to him, So you think Tom Landry's going to coach again this year? <laughs> we know that experience of which Craddock speaks. Carried away to some other place, a holy and blessed place. But all too briefly, and soon we're carried back into a world all too familiar, a world that carries the everyday and the mundane obligations, bills and responsibilities, and doctor's appointments and prescriptions, and disciplining children and caring for parents and homework and deadlines. So I'd love to say that today at least all concerns are at rest, all worries asleep. The weighty demands and obligations of the world on hold because today's Christmas. But were I to say such a thing, would you believe me? Well then, what's the big deal? If Christmas Day offers the same experiences that every other day offers, if this day holds the same concerns and cares held by every other day of the year, if this day will offer no resistance as we give way to tomorrow, what's the big deal? Did you hear the scripture? You did. Heard it many times before, but you came here to hear. No more beloved passage of scripture than this. Yes, telling about Mary and Joseph, the trip to Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus, swaddling clothes, angels' proclamation, shepherd's visit, we heard all of it. But did you hear something else? How the scripture begins came to pass in the days of Caesar Augustus. Big deal. Well, as a matter of fact, this is something of a big deal. That is to say, I believe Luke is providing some very significant information as he begins this account of the birth of Jesus. You see, Luke is telling us that God is breaking into our world in specific ways, in specific times, in specific places. Ours is not a God who acts in general. He's not a God who acts in theory. And Luke is saying that God does not wait for conditions to be perfect in this world before God decides to act. God does not require that all be at peace, that all worries cease, that all debts be cleared, that all be well and healthy and clean. In the midst of all human affairs, amongst Caesars and kings and presidents and rulers, in the midst of the high and mighty as well as in the midst of the low and humble, God acts even in the presence of a newborn child. Now, if God acts in the lives of rulers and shepherds, if God looks upon these lives in the ancient Near East and disrupts the affairs of Caesars and shepherds, it's not the news offered by Luke, news that says that this same God acts in the lives of you and me. So here we come this Christmas morning in a holy and blessed time, in this holy and blessed place, not at all far removed from the real world and real worries and real concerns and real cares. And what do we do here? We say God is with us. We proclaim the good news that God intrudes in our lives just as they are. 
just as we are. So whether it's in the days of Caesar Augustus, President Obama, or any other leader we could name, the good news of the gospel is just as true. God intrudes in the lives of our, in, in our lives in the presence of his Son. God is working his purpose out to save and heal and make you in the ordinary and everyday business of you and me. Our lives don't have to be perfect, to be just right, so as to make way for God. But you know and I know that we often want everything else just to stop, just to stop, to make way for that which is holy and blessed. I remember a few years ago being at a clergy meeting at Chester United Methodist Church, and as part of this meeting, our bishop, Charlene Kammerer, led worship and also led a question and answer time over which she presided. And as I sat in the sanctuary during worship, I could not help but hear, beyond the walls and windows of the sanctuary, children who were running and playing and screaming. I'm guessing they were part of a dare a daycare program that the church operates. And I confess, as I heard the voices of these running, screaming, hollering children, I confess there was a part of me that wanted to stick my head out the window and yell, hey, keep it down, we're worshiping here. Even got the bishop preaching, for heaven's sake. Got the respect for our bishop. But then, by the grace of God, I came to realize that there was something right and appropriate about that scene. For the worship and the adoration of God does take place in the midst of the play of children and the work of adults and running a home and attending to relationships. There was to me a reminder in that scene that God reveals himself even in the midst of the ordinary and every day. You see, not everything else had to stop in order for God to say, look, I'm here. And we're reminded of that quite often here in Ireland. This holy place, this sanctuary, is located at the corner of some busy streets, amen? Right across and get across there to Whataburger for a foot long chili dog, and you'll see it's a lot of traffic out there. <laughs> and even as we worship, we may hear some sirens screaming down the boulevard. We may hear someone's El Camino bouncing up and down Westover Avenue with all strange manner of music coming from the speakers. My apologies to you, El Camino may hear the shouts from one person to another. And while we may think to ourselves, keep it down, we're worshiping God in here, we may also hear, if we listen, the voice of God saying to us, it is just this kind of world where I intrude in the presence of my Son. A world full of noise and distractions and emergencies and the unchurched and those for whom Sunday is just another day. It is for all of this that I have come to save. So this holy hour, it'll pass. And you and I will leave this place for places that appear less holy. But we carry good news. The news that the God who breaks into the lives of Caesars and shepherds and breaks into the lives of Mary and Joseph is the same God who breaks into our lives just as they are. In the days of Caesar Augustus, in our days as well, God intrudes to save and claim. To us is born a Savior. We know him as Jesus because he saves us from our sin. We know him as Emmanuel because God is with us, even us, here and now, and always.